Hello, uh, welcome to this talk. Um, in this talk, I'm going to talk about the building blocks of a quantum co computer. It's called a transmog. Uh, but instead of telling you straight away what a transmog is, let's first discuss how we can build a quantum computer. And I hope that in the end, we will review what a transmog the building block of a quantum computer really is. Uh, to build a quantum computer, uh, let's take inspiration from our own normal computer. Uh, for example, I'm sitting right in front of one. How does it work? How does it perform all those computations and store memories? Well, it turns out it has a lot of bits which can either take the state of one or zero. So, uh, if you remember in the Matrix movie, uh, when Nemo finally opened, Neo finally opened his eyes, he see the whole world made up of zero and ones or, or things like that. Uh, but what are those bits that can be either state zero or one? Let's delve deeper into this. Turns out it's very simple. It's just little capacitors in our computer. Uh, if you remember, a capacitor can store charges. So if a capacitor does not have any charge on it, it's state zero. And if a capacitor has charge stored on it, then it is state one. It's as simple as that. For example, here we have a capacitor with charges stored on it. Of course, uh, both plates will have charges of opposite kind, positive and negative. And if there's no charge on this capacitor, it is the zero state. So our computer really is made up of lots and lots of capacitors, which can be either state zero or state one. If we want to build a quantum computer, uh, for now, we are also thinking, can we make something that can take two possible states, which will then correspond to zero or one? In fact, a quantum computer is more than that. Let's say we do have a system that can be in either zero or one. The quantum bit will not be in a very defined state, like a classical bit. It will, in fact, be a superposition of zero and one, much like Schrodinger's cat. But I haven't told you how to achieve uh, state zero and state one, how to achieve this kind of two-level system yet. We'll see how we can achieve that. How about we just use our uh, good old capacitor in a normal computer? It has two possible states. Is it possible that we can treat it like a quantum system? For example, it's uh, small. And if we don't observe it, if we don't look at it, maybe it is in a superposition state of zero and one. But it turns out, even though we are not looking at it, the other parts of the circuit is actually observing this capacitor. Uh, how does it do that? Well, the electrons are moving around in the wire and occasionally it will collide with those ions in the wire. And once collision happens, the game is up. The wire will know where all the charges are and it will immediately collapse that superposition state to either zero or one, even though we humans are not observing it. Somehow, the rest of the circuit is still observing it. And you might say interacting with it. For example, the electrons colliding with the ions. So how do we solve that? How can we preserve a quantum state? If, if we don't have a quantum state, then we just have the normal classical uh, state with definite outcome, zero or one. How can we preserve this quantum state? The key is we use superconductors. Inside the superconductor, the electrons are paired up like uh, two dancing partners, and they will dance through the wire without colliding with any of the ions, which is quite magical. It will definitely not collide with any of the ions. So the ions and the rest of the circuit will not be able to observe what they're doing and they can keep their secret. They can either be uh, 
zero or one in a superposition state. Nobody knows what it is. And the other idea uh, is this. So we have a superconductor that can preserve quantum information. Now, how can we build a two state system with zero and one? Uh, people came up with this peculiar idea. Maybe we can use an LC circuit. You can see this LC circuit is an oscillator. It's uh, the spiral part is an inductor. The plates are uh, capacitors and the energy oscillates between the inductor and the capacitor. It can have certain frequencies. So for example, uh, sorry. For example, if we shine a light on it, we can excite this oscillator to another level of energy. And maybe with all these different energy levels, we can produce a two level system out of this circuit. Ah, but there's a problem. Uh, if we do the quantum mechanical analysis of the circuit uh, and solve the Schrodinger equation for this uh, circuit, we find that the energy levels for this oscillator, they are all equally spaced out. All those horizontal lines in this picture correspond to the possible energy levels. They're all equally spaced out. What does this mean? This, this means when we shine light on it, it can excite this circuit from the ground state to the first excited state, but there's nothing stopping it from getting further excited to the next level because it just requires the same amount of energy to jump to the second level and indeed the third level and fourth level and so on. So this will not be a two level system. Once we shine light on it, this circuit could be in the ground state first excited state, second excited state, third excited state, and so forth. This is not a two level system, so no good. And somebody proposed, how about we replace the inductor with a thing called Josephson junction? It's a very cool name, so why not we try something cool? And uh, a Josephson junction is like an inductor, but it has a big difference. We're gonna talk about it. What is a Josephson junction? Well. It is made up of two superconducting materials, sandwiching an insulator. For example, in the uh, right um, bottom picture, we have niobium, which is a superconducting material. And we see two islands of them, and they are separated by some insulators. And the electrons are paired up in those niobium islands. They can move around freely, but they can also jump across to the other island that's called quantum tunneling. So there's current flowing between these two niobium islands. This junction basically permits some flow of pairs of electrons. But the big difference is the energy diagram for the Josephson junction. It's different from the normal inductor. Well, it doesn't look like much. Uh, this is the energy levels for this uh, Josephson junction and capacitor system. And we can see that, uh, well, it does look like the energy levels are not equally spaced now. Uh, it's not too obvious, but um, it is the case. <laughs> so um, I use different colors to uh, kind of symbolize the fact that we need different energy to jump to the different levels. So now if we shine light on it and we control the frequency of the light such that only the jump from the ground state to the first excited state, that is a green arrow, if only that is possible, then we do have a two level system. The light is only at uh, the right frequency for the jump uh, from the ground state to the First excited state, it is not at the right level for the jump um, associated with the red arrow or the purple arrow or indeed any other arrows. So the circuit can only be in the ground state or the first excited state. We have a two level system now.
and it's also superconducting. Josephson junction is made of superconductors. So now we have a quantum mechanical system. It can be in either zero or one. And indeed, there are only two possible levels, zero or one, the ground state and the first excited state. Yes, that is what we call a quantum bit, a qubit. It's two level and it can preserve quantum information. Nobody can observe it. It's superconducting. And this Josephson junction connected in parallel with the capacitor is actually our transmitter. So finally, I reveal what our transmitter is. Uh, its full name is transmission line shunted plasma oscillation qubit. A very long name. What does that mean? Well, as we have seen already, this qubit is excited by light. Actually, more specifically, microwave light, which are carried along by transmission lines. So all these qubits are actually sitting in an array of transmission lines, which is why it's called the first part of its name, transmission line. And it's also an oscillator, as we have discussed. It's kind of like an LC circuit with uh, the normal inductor replaced by Josephson junction, but it's also oscillating and we can excite it. And given the right energy of the microwave, we can only excite the first excited state. So this system can only have two possible states. It is therefore a quantum bit, qubit. How does the transmitter really look like? Well, here is a picture. In the little blue box, you can see a zoomed in view of the Josephson junction. It's right in the middle. And all those teeth like uh, things around it, that's actually the capacitor. Turns out we really need a big capacitor uh, to make this element work well. And the way to, uh, we can either have a really big capacitor or we can kind of make this kind of teeth like uh, uh, structure to increase the capacitance. So this is what it looks like in real life. Uh, the IBM quantum computer is based on this transmog technology. Uh, it might be that in the future, we have different uh, systems uh, based on different physics. For example, the spin of electron, it can also take two possible states up and down. Uh, so we will see how the technology will develop. But hopefully uh, this talk gives you an idea uh, what we need to build a quantum computer. We need a quantum system that preserves its information. It's not disturbed by other observers. And it has to have two levels. Then we have what we call a qubit, the building block of a quantum computer. Thank you for listening.